Hi there. I'm Dr. Steve Klein from the Department of Communication at the University of Missouri. This is the latest in a series of online video lessons intended to provide you important principles and helpful concepts for the study of argumentation. This is actually the second part of a two-part series, getting some practice in using the Toolman diagram model of argument analysis to see how arguments are put together. In the first video in the series, not only did we review the simple Toolman diagram with the three primary components or building blocks of argument, but I described what I was referring to as a think aloud example, uh, an approach to using metacognition or thinking about how you're thinking in order to deepen and improve your understanding of how you're working through complex problems or new processes or procedures. So what I'm doing in these videos is modeling a practice that I would suggest for you as you learn how to do this argument analysis for the first time. Not just thinking about it silently in your head and writing things down, but also actually talking through how you're thinking and what your possible choices or decision points or sticky or muddy sections are. So right now we're gonna dispense with the review of the Toolman model. If you need to freshen up on that, check out part one in the series or other videos in my uh, series where I talk about the Toolman model in more detail. For now, let's get to our next example. Okay, this one is also a letter to the editor uh, in the Columbia, Missouri, and this one was written a little bit earlier in 2021 by Ellen Wins. The freedom to vote was one of the founding fathers' principles for our great nation. No matter our zip code, we deserve to have our voices heard by allowing us easy access to voting. In this nation, voting is very secure. Any hurdle put in the way of us casting our vote is an effort by a handful of extremist politicians to muzzle our voices. It is we the people who should choose our leaders, not our leaders choosing their voters. We must fight for our freedom to vote. Call your U.S. representative and senator and ask them to support H.R. 1 S. 1, known as the For the People Act. You can find their contact info at https colon slash slash www.govtrack.us slash. By protecting our freedom to vote, it allows us to work together and make our nation an even better place to live. Okay, just like any other argument, we need to start with this assumption. There's lots of smaller individual argumentative moves being made in this letter to the editor. But what we want to do is not try to account for every bit of it, but we want to try to account for what is the most important argument. What is the thing that this letter writer really wants us to pull out? And so we need to first, before we do anything else, identify the claim. And so let's go through here. And again, there are a number of sentences that could potentially be identified as a claim, so for instance, we deserve to have our voices heard, um, might be something that could be a claim. And the evidence for that claim is that was something that the founding fathers had as a principle when the nation was founded. So there's lots of different argumentative moves in here. But what's the most important claim? And as you move through the letter, it becomes pretty obvious, right? The primary claim being offered is that you should call your U.S. representative and senator and ask them to support the For the People Act. Again, another example of a policy claim, a claim that's advocating a course of action. So in the claim box, we can put, call your U.S. representative and senator, ask them to support the For the People Act. Okay, so we've got our claim. Now, why should we ask them to support the For the People Act? What we need to do here is try to find why is it that this For the People Act is something that's even necessary in the first place. And there are a lot of assumptions about what we deserve, what we need to have, uh, principles about who should choose leaders and things like that. But those statements don't necessarily get us at the central point why is it that we need the For the People Act passed? Why do we want our representatives and senators to support the For the People Act? What is the primary reason? And the primary reason, as you move through this letter, pops out at a certain point. Any hurdle put in the way of us casting our vote is an effort by a handful of extremist politicians to muzzle our voices. So that's one reason why we would want to have a For the People Act. Related to this is a connected idea right underneath that sentence. 
It is we the people who should choose our leaders, not our leaders choosing their voters. Okay, so we've got a couple of potential pieces of evidence, but what is it that actually makes this evidence as opposed to reasoning? Well, first of all, put aside the reasoning point until we know what is the primary support that's backing up this claim. And an important premise, an important assumption that's necessary in order to figure out that this is actually evidence depends on us understanding the context of the argument. Not everything in an argument is going to be stated out loud. Now, there's a couple of hints at it here, right? Uh, no matter our zip code, we deserve to have our voices heard, right? In this nation, voting is very secure. Well, why is that point being made? Uh, any hurdle put in the way of us casting our vote is an effort to muzzle our voices. Well, what kind of hurdles is the writer talking about? Well, if you're familiar with the public controversy of voter suppression legislation in many places in the United States, then this starts to make sense. There are a lot of state governments as well as efforts within the U.S. Congress itself to enact certain forms of legislation in the name of protecting against voter fraud. And these include things like requiring voters to have uh, picture IDs, uh, limiting the amount of time that voters can actually access polling places, uh, eliminating things like mail-in voting and things like that. And a lot of these pieces of legislation are being advocated in the name of protecting against voter fraud. However, in the point that this writer makes, in this nation, voting is very secure, the writer is reminding us of some additional information that's also important to the context, that there are very few cases, proportionally speaking, of voter fraud that exist in the United States. Study after study and um, research after research tells us that voter fraud is very, very, very infrequent. And in fact, we have a very secure voting policy. But what the contextual information also tells us is that a lot of the places where these various legislative actions are taking place are happening at the expense of certain types of people being able to have equal access to voting. So there's been a lot of coverage in the news, for instance, on how certain approaches to, quote unquote, voter fraud protection legislation is actually resulting in suppressing the access to vote for poor people or people of color or people who live in certain neighborhoods as opposed to other neighborhoods that might really support one political party over the other political party. Now, of course. None of this detail is in this letter to the editor, right? Uh, this person is writing a letter to the editor because the intended audience is somebody who reads the Missourian. And, you know, the assumption here is that people who read the newspaper are in all likelihood going to be aware of this particular controversy in the public sphere. So what does this mean? Well, let's go back to our diagram to see how is it that calling your representative to support the For the People Act, how is this being supported? Well, first of all, note that we've got a couple of pieces of evidence that were explicitly included in the article, right? That hurdles that are put in the way of casting votes is an effort to muzzle our voices. And we've got another piece of evidence that, again, this is a premise that an audience would accept, that we the people should choose our leaders, our leaders shouldn't choose our voters. But that evidence in and of itself doesn't necessarily make sense as evidence unless we also include some implicit evidence that the writer did not include in the letter, but she's presuming that we're already familiar with it. And that's with regard to current efforts being made to suppress voting in certain districts in order to favor one party over another. When you bring that implicit evidence in, it, which is, again, this is not something that we're just making up out of our own heads, right? This is something that we've been able to infer from the various contextual clues in the letter itself, right? We're not making up our own implicit evidence. We're pulling it from what we can deduce from what the author has given us. 
So once you take into account that, yeah, there's current efforts being made to suppress voting uh, to favor one party over the other, then you add to that what's explicitly being provided when you put hurdles in the way of voters, it muzzles voices, and we the people need to choose our leaders, not the other way around. So we've got three specific pieces of evidence, two that are explicit, one that are implicit. But we still need to figure out how we get from those particular premises in the evidence to the policy claim that this For the People Act needs to be supported. So where are the pieces of reasoning? So this gets us to another potential complication, although it can be a productive complication, in figuring out how these arguments work. And that is, there are a number of different premises in this argument that could potentially work as warrants or as reasoning links between the evidence and the claim. One of them, for instance, is no matter our zip code, we deserve to have our voices heard by allowing us easy access to voting. So because if the evidence is telling us there are people who are having their easy access to voting being taken away, and that's an attempt to muzzle our voices, then this premise would be an important one that'll connect us to the claim. Another premise, we must fight for our freedom to vote. Uh, that's a premise that is getting at this notion that, hey, our right to vote is being taken away. That's something that's provided in the evidence. The claim is asking us to do something that's going to get Congress to pass this act. So this might be something that mediates in between. And there's another reason why our action is relevant to this matter. And that's by protecting our freedom to vote. It allows us to work together and makes our nation an even better place to live. So if we go back to our diagram, then we've got our claim, we've got our evidence, we can fill into the warrant box these three premises. And so you can see at this point, and that's the beauty of the Toolman model, is that you can actually visualize the way that the logic works in the argument. Any hurdle put in the way of us casting our vote is an effort by a handful of extremist politicians to muzzle our voices. And because we deserve to have our voices heard no matter where we live, we need to have this act passed. Uh, it's we the people who should choose our leaders, not our leaders choosing our voters, but our leaders are actually trying to choose our voters. So we need to fight for our freedom to vote because fighting for our freedom to vote is going to make our nation better. And so because these things are happening and we need to fight to prevent them from happening, this is something that we need to do. We need to call our U.S. representative and senator and ask them to support the For the People Act. Okay, so as you can see, Toolman analysis can be relatively involved and it takes a bit of cognitive work, even if the argument is something as short as a letter to the editor. And in fact, if you're thinking about wanting to get some additional practice in Toolman diagramming, finding letters to the editor in a national and local newspapers is a great way to find examples of very short, discrete arguments uh, that you can unpack in, in basically, it's like coming up with your own math homework problems, right? The best way to learn how to do this kind of toolman analysis is to just practice it over and over again. So here's what I want you to pull out of this think aloud example, besides the importance of getting practice in working through how to analyze simple arguments with a Toolman diagram. The first takeaway point is that for any individual claim in a larger argument, there could potentially be multiple pieces of evidence and or multiple warrants, multiple reasoning premises that will get you from point A to point B logically. It's not necessarily always going to be the case that there will be one specific sentence with a piece of evidence in it and one warrant that's going to get you to the claim. There could potentially be a number of interrelated pieces. The key is, and this is where the diagram comes in, do the various pieces work logically when you have this visual configuration. So you can see the evidence supports the claim because the reasoning connects them. The second key takeaway is that while you can potentially find lots of things explicitly articulated in any argument, don't forget that arguers in the public sphere very often include implicit, unstated, tacit elements in the argument that the arguer is presuming that the audience is going to be able to fill in for themselves. 
And that's because the audience and the arguer are going to share a larger context of disagreement. So just because you don't, for instance, see a sentence written down in an argument that provides a clear warrant between the evidence and the claim, that doesn't mean a warrant's not there. That means that you need to put yourself in the shoes of the arguer and ask yourself, what would be the logical inference if I were to write it down, what would I write down? that would help get me from the evidence to the claim in a clear and a direct logical way. Don't forget those implicit pieces, they're really important. Okay, so as always, if you've got any questions about this or any of the content in my other videos, please don't hesitate to reach out and let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you next time.